Hi everyone uh, and welcome to today's webinar on the Building the New Biosecurity Act. My name is Jen Barwick and I am a Project and Policy Officer here at PERSA and I am working with the project team here um, who's working to develop the new Biosecurity Act. Many of you will already know the gentlemen that are above and below me in the video call. Um, and so today's host is Andrew Copas, who's the program manager, thanks, give a wave, uh, and leading the development of the new act. And above us is executive director, Nathan Rhodes for Biosecurity SA, and he's obviously helping lead the development of the act. So um, my role today, I am uh, here to do a little bit of housekeeping at the start and then I'm gonna turn my video off and I'm gonna sit in the back end and monitor the questions and just help with uh, the general sort of uh, housekeeping and tech behind the scenes. So should it all go wrong, um, I suggest you blame Andrew. So um, <laughs> today's agenda is going to um, involve uh, obviously a bit of welcome, but we're gonna to introduce to you the, the approach we're taking to develop the new act, which is what we're consulting on at the moment. So, um, and we're going to encourage your feedback as much as possible. So we've got a few ways of doing that and I'll take you through in just a second. Um, but, um, and then we're gonna wrap up at the end with a Q and A. Um, and we want to hear from you. We want to. Uh, we want you to ask questions. We want you to provide feedback. Everything that is uh, done and spoken about today, it's, uh, the webinar will be recorded, and we'll also be using the feedback and as part of the overall uh, reporting that we do during consultation, we'll be putting it all in and 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 considering it. So as we move forward. Uh, Yes, so first thing I wanted to say is webinars are a bit different. You're going to see that uh, unlike to the team meetings and the Zoom meetings that we've all been attending for the last six months, um, that you're not going to have access to your camera and your microphone, but we can still hear from you in a multiple of ways. So the first thing is down the bottom, you're going to see a bit of a Q&A button on, at the bottom of your screen and a, a little panel and a window should pop up. Um, if you have a question or you want to make a comment to something that Andrew is saying or one of the polls that we ask, you want to provide some more context, context into what you are in what you're saying, add it there um, and we will um, we will collect that Q&A and we'll and we'll talk to it at the end of the, the um, session that Andrew does. So you can also upvote the questions. You'll see a little thumbs up icon behind, beside some of the comments and you can you can um, upvote it. And the ones that get the lot of thumbs up, they'll go to the top of the list and be the first ones that Andrew can respond to. You can also raise your hand. So you'll see the hand at the bottom of the uh, chat box, I think, um, or the participant box. And uh, so if you raise your hand, um, we will see that and we can turn your microphone, I can turn your microphone on in the back end and then um, you'll be able to actually speak up and have the floor. So you'll actually be able to talk to your, um, your query or your comment. Um, and you're welcome to do that um, throughout, but um, particularly in the Q&A section <coughs> at the end. Uh, and then we are going to, I'll get the next slide, Andrew, and uh, we're gonna have some poll questions. So. Um, these poll questions are based on the Your Say survey. So some of you may have come to this webinar through the Your Say site, which we're using to um, get submissions and, and share the information about how we're developing this new act. Um, but these are going to be a little bit different. So on the Your Say site, the survey questions have an option for free text. Today's webinar, it's, it's not so easy. So what we're going to do is it's just a, it's a multiple choice. You know, do you agree? Do you disagree? Or are you not sure? But also, if you do want to put some further context around it, you can put it in the Q&A box. So we encourage that. We'd like to hear the more context, the more we can understand how you're feeling about this and what you what you support, what you don't support, the better this um, will be for everyone. So um, that's, I think, my, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to row test the polls. So I forgot to do that in the last webinar. So I'll do this one now. So the first poll we have today is, um, it's just, a, it's just a rough one. It's not a rough one. It's a, it's a, just a general one. We want to know where you're from. So I'm going to launch the poll now and you should be able to see it up in front of you. It's just asking what industry sector do you represent? Um, if you can have a go and start filling that out and let us know where you're from, that would be great. Make sure it all works. It's working fabulous. All right. I'll give you a few more seconds. That's great. We do actually have some private business people here today. I saw you guys register and welcome. It's great to have you uh, participate and, and um, have you engage with what we're doing in this world in the Biosecurity Act. So it's 
fantastic to see. All right, well, I think I'll wrap that one up for now. And I will share the results. Great. Um, and as you can see, industry, the board, industry board and association um, is representing, and that's fantastic. Uh, they're the people we are working really closely with to develop this new act. So I'm gonna stop that now and uh, hand over to Mr. Copas. Thank you. Thank you, Jen, for that introduction. Um, so as Jen said, I'm Andrew Copas, and I've got the privilege of being the project manager for the delivery of uh, a new Biosecurity Act for South Australia, working closely with um, Biosecurity SA um, and Nathan Rhodes, who's with us here today. Um, so what I really wanna do is give everyone an, an overview of the proposed approach to the new Biosecurity Act. Um, <clears throat> what, what I'm talking through today actually represents 18 months of um, quite intensive targeted consultation. So there's um, been quite a lot of work to engage early on this project with some um, key stakeholders and a, a number of you um, are familiar uh, with the project so far uh, and we've had some engagement with you um, to date. Um, and what we've done is really um, use that engagement to inform the direction that we're proposing to head um, and capture a lot of that information um, within the technical directions paper, which has now been released for public consultation and is available on our website and also the Your Say website. Um, so a lot of what I'll cover today, um, for those of you that have been engaged in the project, will feel very familiar. Uh, and for those of you that are joining us uh, and engaging for the first time, welcome. Um, and any further information um, that you'd like to get, um, feel free to contact us. Or, um, as I said, it's available within the technical directions paper um, and also within some of the other information, like fact sheets, um, that have been um, listed up on the department's website and the Your Say website. Um, so really today is about giving that overview, that understanding of where we're proposing to head before we start drafting legislation. Um, and again, undertake further consultation once we have a draft bill. Um, and really we'll want your feedback. We want your views um, to help inform that stage of the project. So please, as Jen said, um, use the Q&A function. Um, um, we'd love to hear your feedback formally through the Your Say website, either through um, responding to the survey or providing a, um, a submission. Um, and also, you know, feel free to reach out and contact the team for any um, additional meetings or conversations or, or, you know, if you want to have a chat on the phone and give feedback in that, that way, then that's completely okay as well. So all of this is going to be really important, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, in informing the draft bill and the direction that we want to head. So to start off, um, just to give a bit of an overview of the purpose and the objectives um, that we're trying to achieve in the new Biosecurity Act. So I'm sure we can all agree that um, primary industries are a critical part of South Australia's economy. Um, and as we all know um, and live every day, biosecurity risks are a continued challenge. They're growing in their scale and their complexity, um, <clears throat> excuse me, through increased trade and um, travel. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, so I've got a bit of hay fever yesterday and I'm struggling a bit today. Um, so, you know, a new biosecurity act is an important step to making sure that we strengthen um, our system. Um, and you know, stay ahead of the curve of these continuing um, and growing risks in biosecurity. Um, so we don't have a broken system, we have a very good system, but what this is about is looking to any opportunities to actually improve our system so we can continue to, to provide a level of protection into the future um, as our world becomes more complex and, and continues to change. Um, so the fundamental purpose of uh, developing a new biosecurity act um, is to protect South Australia from pests and diseases that are economically significant. Um, they threaten our terrestrial or aquatic environments, or they may affect public amenities um, and community um, activities, or maybe even infrastructure. So what we're proposing is um, really a contemporary piece of legislation, a, a legal framework, which will have all the components required in a comprehensive um, biosecurity act to achieve that fundamental purpose. And as we develop the new act, we aim to keep the best parts of our current approach. So, you know, we're not, we don't want to throw out what's working well, and there's a lot that is working well. But we also want to build in those opportunities for improvement in the future and look at those contemporary approaches and especially looking at um, examples across other jurisdictions that we're um, working closely with that have already developed consolidated biosecurity acts. So by doing that, we'll increase consistency across the, the model that we have, um, but we'll also be able to build in those innovative approaches that may exist within one sector specific piece of legislation and broaden that out and apply it across all the sectors that we work with. So that's not only consistency in our approach, but it also brings about those new opportunities 
and it's a more efficient um, environment for us to operate in both you know for government but also for those that interact with biosecurity legislation and policies you know so you know industries and um, communities businesses um, those sorts of things um, the core concepts um, uh, form part of the new act and, and we're building in a, and it's the foundation for the new legislation um, and that is again on those modern principles that we can see in examples across other jurisdictions so we, we refer to them as core concepts but they're sort of those foundational principles those those new modern approaches um, and so those the three core concepts being shared responsibility risk-based decision making and, and proactive biosecurity management um, but I'll touch on them a little bit more detail later in the session. Um, and thinking nationally, um, the South Australian Biosecurity Act will look to con uh, continue to work within the national model and, and align as much as possible um, nationally and, and with the other jurisdictions, you know, for those the benefit of, of that national model. Um, and um, looking, you know, to make sure that we can continue to support and enhance trade arrangements for South Australia's foods, fibre and beverages, um, and give effect to some of those intergovernmental agreements that we're um, signed up to. So we want to align our arrangements where appropriate, um, you know, both nationally and with the other jurisdictions, states and territories that we, we work with as part of that national model. In terms of outcomes of the reform, what, what are we trying to achieve? So with the new Biosecurity Act, South Australia will, for the very first time, have a consistent legal approach to biosecurity management across all sectors under a single set of principles. So it means that we'll have the same consistent framework for both sort of plant um, health and, and animal health, um, and also fisheries and aquaculture biosecurity, and also the management of wild dogs. So there's a real opportunity here for that consistency and that single focus. Um, that's not to say that biosecurity is not focused and, and consistent at the moment. Um, it's, it's um, you know, the, the different acts are managed by the same team. Um, and they all work under the state biosecurity policy and obviously work very well together. So we do have that um, good management um, practice in Biosecurity SA, but this is about the consistency across the legal framework, that the, the number of acts that manage biosecurity um, is what I'm referring to. So one of the areas we wanna do is about modernizing our approach. So we wanna introduce that greater flexibility to respond to biosecurity threats. Um, and we wanna enable action based on a reasonable suspicion of risk. Um, we also want to enhance South Australia's ability to meet trade market protocols, protocols sorry, and improve market access. Uh, so an example there would by, be by establishing uh, pest-free areas, um, which are recognised by key export markets. We also want to modernise by enabling the identification and uptake of new technologies uh, and methodologies to support a strong biosecurity system. Um, and we also want to appropriately share responsibility for biosecurity between government, industry and the community to get the best outcome. We want to make improvements. So we want to reduce red tape. We, you know, and that will come about by consolidating uh, the administration of legislation, empowering industry to take a lead where, where that um, um, is possible and appropriate. Uh, and that will be through you know, accreditation programs or recognising appropriate industry-based practices uh, to avoid any duplication with government requirements and, and industry practices. We want to uh, enable consistency in applying an evidence-based risk analysis approach to biosecurity management and events. And we want to improve governance arrangements and interactions with other South Australian acts. We want to ensure clear and strong powers for biosecurity officers and a comprehensive compliance framework to manage biosecurity risks and uh, establish effective deterrence for those that seek to do the wrong thing. And it's also an opportunity to enhance knowledge and understanding of biosecurity among the South Australian community. So by doing this project and having um, some um, communication, some profile, these webinars around the new act is an opportunity to actually raise awareness about well, what is biosecurity, why is it important, and why do we need to maintain that standard of um, practice within um, our industries. And the third area we want to bring about is consistency and efficiency, which I've touched on uh, a little bit already. But that uh, efficient, harmonised system, not only for government, but also for industry and the community as well. Um, and then, as I spoke of, you know, that consistency in biosecurity management with other jurisdictions and the national model is a, is a big opportunity there. And the ability to establish additional industry-based boards and funding mechanisms to achieve specific industry-based biosecurity outcomes. Um, there's opportunity, there are potentially opportunities there as well, and I'll touch on those a little bit later. Now, I just want to also um, just be clear on um, the type of act that we're looking to develop, and that is what we um, commonly refer to as framework legislation. 
So what this will be is um, a general act a, a, or a head of power, as it's sometimes called, that contains the provisions uh, in a general sense that are designed to give effect to a particular policy. So the act will contain all matters of importance uh, for the implementation of a particular policy, but the detail of how that policy um, is triggered or it applies will be contained, contained within subordinate instruments um, or secondary legislation, which are commonly, you know, one of the most common forms is a regulation. So with this approach, the benefits are the regulations will support the operation of the act by prescribing the detail, but that also brings about a, a measure of flexibility um, and responsiveness. So any um, future changes that need to be made to our legislation or any innovation that we want to build in can be done by um, changing regulations or other instruments rather than having to open up and completely redesign the legislation. So just to reiterate, having a general act that gives the effect to all of the policies, all the powers that we need, and then all of the detail sitting in regulation um, and other instruments to give effect to those policy positions. So we're just gonna um, jump now into a poll question. So I'll just hand over to Jen to quickly do that one. All right, thank you for that. So um, interesting results. So we've um, you know, sort of uh, neck and neck um, tied for important and not sure um, with a, um, a very important um, rating high as well. So um, what we've found through some of the conversations that we've had already is that some of that uncertainty around the new biosecurity that comes with um, wanting to see some of the details. So, you know, the proposals at a general high level sense, um, you know, sounds good to, to, to people, um, generally speaking. Um, but then, you know, just a little bit of caution, uh, uncertainty around, well, how is that going to apply? How is that actually going to affect uh, me, my industry, my business? Um, so, you know, if that's if that's the case, um, completely understandable, and we will continue to try and provide as much detail as possible, um, and uh, giving some insight into what the regulations are um, planning to achieve in parallel to the Act uh, as much as we can. Um, but um, if that's not the case, if there's something else driving your uncertainty, um, I'd love to hear about it in the Q and A um, section, or you know, contact us outside of the webinar. So moving on. Um, I just want to touch a little bit more about the core con concepts that I've already um, uh, briefly mentioned. So the first one being shared responsibility. So this proposed core concept of shared responsibility uh, would underpin uh, and further strengthen and strengthen government, industry and the people of South Australia, so our community, working together to protect our economy, environment um, and the community from any negative impacts of pests and diseases. And that's to the benefit of all of South Australia. So strong and effective biosecurity is, is um, in the best interest of everyone. And um, it does very much relies on a partnership approach. So not one person entity um, can do everything. So it really needs everyone sort of working together for those common goals, those common outcomes. So to continue to protect and support um, our biosecurity, so the government will um, continue to provide um, adequate resourcing and lead and coordinate where a response, where we're responsible and, and it's appropriate to do so. So, you know, in the case of a, an emergency outbreak, it would be a uh, you know, clear role for government there to lead those responses. So we're not looking at stepping away from our responsibilities. But, you know, when we talk about shared responsibility, what we want to do is be able to provide the tools and the ability for industry to be empowered and have an option to take a stronger leadership role uh, in managing their own biosecurity outcomes. So shared responsibility is not a new concept for South Australia, um, but it will require some new additions to our legislation to express um, the, um, the concept that we're proposing. Um, and there's also going to be a requirement for education and training in terms of you know, what is, what is uh, um, someone's responsibility and how can that responsibility be met. So arrangements for sharing responsibility in biosecurity are, are becoming more common and more prevalent. Um, so examples would be codes of practice, uh, regulatory standards, 
quality and market assurance schemes um, and joint management plans are just a few examples where government and industry are partnering to, to for biosecurity outcomes. The second um, expression of shared responsibility um, is the general biosecurity duty. So we're proposing to establish a general um, duty, a legislative duty, which will create an obligation for all South Australians to use a reasonable standard of care when dealing with any material uh, that prevents a biosecurity risk. So the general duty will legally require anyone who is aware or reasonably should be aware that a biosecurity risk exists to ensure as far as reasonably practical that the risk is mitigated, eliminated or reduced. So similar requirements already exist in South Australia. So for example, prohibiting the movement of disease stock to a sale yard or the selling of fruit infested with a fruit fly. So they're, they're examples of a current duty of care. Um, so it's not a new concept, concept in South Australia. Uh, and section six of the Plant Health Act um, requires a person to report a pest affected plant or product uh, and take all reasonable measures to protect the spread. So it's building on that existing concept uh, and broadening it out to a general duty of care. Um, South Australia is not unique uh, with this either. So if we do end up having this general duty, um, we'll be um, the same in New South Wales, Tasmania and Queensland or all, all um, have a general biosecurity duty or some of them call it an obligation and that's within their consolidated biosecurity act. The next area um, is around accreditation authorities. So we're proposing that the state government is able to recognise non-government organisations as accreditation authorities uh, and those authorities will then be authorised to accredit biosecurity certifiers uh, and auditors to audit and inspect business operations um, or provide product certification. Uh, again, not a new concept, um, but is currently not consistently applied across all sectors as it exists within the Plant Health Act, but it doesn't currently exist within the Livestock Act. Um, and this approach could also see formal recognition of industry-based quality assurance programs for you know, regulatory purposes. There's opportunities here. Um, the other area I wanna to touch on is biosecurity programs. So we're looking at example in Western Australia and also Tasmania, where in Western Australia, they've got their Biosecurity and Agricultural Management Act, which enables a landholder uh, to come together to, with other landholders and establish a recognised biosecurity program, or uh, sorry, a recognised biosecurity group. Um, and that's an expression of shared responsibility uh, that enables the industry um, and the communities to partner with a range of organisations, uh, including the state government, to potentially access funding for their biosecurity program. Um, the Western Australian Act allows a rate to be uh, set uh, for the purposes of that biosecurity program um, from, and collected from that group's operational area. Um, and then there's the option for those funds to be matched by the state government. And there's a, a process they have to go through to have that um, developed and assessed and approved. Uh, Tasmania has a similar approach in their biosecurity act, um, which provides for biosecurity programs. Um, and they can be administered by a government, an industry group, or a non-profit um, organisation, such as an environmental organisation. Um, Tasmania's biosecurity programs um, can be established for um, outcomes such as eradication, eradicating weeds or feral animals um, from a particular regional area, or to promote the adoption of an industry-wide disease control and prevention measures uh, by a particular, particular commodity sector. Um, so these types of programs are another way of expressing um, shared responsibility in, in legislation um, and partnerships between government, industry, community groups. Um, so we're considering that as part of the new Biosecurity Act. So we'd love to hear any feedback about any opportunities that you see as part of that. The second core concept around risk-based decisions. So this is one of the guiding principles for um, Biosecurity in South Australia, that risk management approach. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's applied to, uh, and used to set priorities and investment across biosecurity management. Um, so this is um, uh, proposed to continue as a core concept in the new Biosecurity Act. The aim of risk-based decision-making is to ensure that steps are taken to manage biosecurity risks um, and the, the, any steps taken are effective and proportionate to the risk that they're trying to address. So the new Biosecurity Act proposes to focus on biosecurity risks that are all likely to become a significant problem for our economy, our environment or social amenity. So the identification, assessment and prioritisation of biosecurity risks will ensure that any resources that we deploy um, will be deployed to the highest risk areas 
uh, and the most appropriate response is, is provided. So in a risk-based framework, the highest level of regulation would be applied to biosecurity matter prepared as prohibited. Um, and this matter is matter that would have a significant adverse impact uh, and therefore needs to be tightly regulated. As we go down the scale uh, and biosecurity risk decreases, the need for regulatory control would also decrease. Um, and so low biosecurity matter at the very bottom end of the scale would likely be managed through the general biosecurity duty. In terms of the third core concept, proactive biosecurity. So the new act will, will appropriately have a focus on prevention um, or early detection, um, not or, as well as early detection, um, and will provide the ability to be proactive in response to emerging biosecurity risks, which is really important. But we also wanna provide strong and effective powers to respond where we haven't been able to prevent or early detect um, so we're able to um, you know, respond appropriately to, to address the situation. So our current legislation already provides the ability to be proactive in managing most biosecurity risks. And the new Biosecurity Act will build on this capacity and ensure that any gaps are addressed. And we can continue to take, take immediate action to manage any risk. One of the areas where um, there is an opportunity to, to um, improve in this area is um, managing the risk of biofouling on vessels. So that's um, the hull of a, a boat or, or um, some, you know, a barge or any other infrastructure that's in the water, um, collecting um, weeds and, and animals clinging to the, to the infrastructure, the hull, uh, and then carrying either a pest species or a disease within um, a species and moving between you know, regions in, in the state or moving um, from international waters or, or other um, interstate waters. So we want to be able to um, look at what tools we need to be able to manage the risk of vessels moving um, before we have evidence um, that that um, risk is actually there. So um, that's, that's one of the areas where we can make an improvement. Um, the Plant Health Act and the Livestock Act already allow action based on reasonable suspicion uh, and they use proactive management tools such as the plant quarantine standard um, which imposes entry conditions to manage the risk to our plant industries. Um, and also has the ability to put orders in place to quickly um, um, manage a situation uh, while further um, information and evidence is, is collected to um, inform the next steps for the response. So the new Act will propose to have that ability for um, preemptive action based on a reasonable suspicion, which is then sometimes referred to as the precautionary principle, um, that a serious biosecurity risk exists. Uh, without having the need to wait for scientific confirmation. So, you know, waiting for an interstate laboratory to provide test results. Um, so that will enable a rapid response um, and improve our ability to prevent establishing um, pet, new pests and diseases establishing, um, which is really important in biosecurity. So just moving on now to another um, quick poll question. I'll just hand over to Ben to run that one. All right, thank you for that. So, um, so there's um, a strong agreement for the core concepts. Um, some strong agree, uh, again, a few not, not sure, and, and um, also some disagreement as well. So um, those of you that have some uncertainty or, or don't agree, would love to hear more about that um, to inform our thinking, but it looks like there's the majority um, support generally for those core concepts, which is great. So thank you for that. Um, I just um, just turn to the Q and A. So there's a, a question that's um, coming in, um, one from uh, Robert Chin, which is a great question about um, you know I've talked a lot about protecting South Australia, um, and is there any component of this that talks about cross border protection, so protecting other states and territories? Um, so in terms of um, 
other jurisdictions, so they would have their own species of concern um, and prohibited list. So there would be restrictions in terms of what could move from South Australia into a, another state or territory. Um, so that's part of the protection. But also um, by maintaining a standard of biosecurity, um, you know, that has a positive impact on our um, other states and territories as well, because if something um, was to come exotic to Australia into South Australia first, well then having a, a proactive um, quick response to contain that situation is the benefit um, of the national model, other states and territories. Um, but also, you know, just having um, good protection to stop it coming in in the first place is really important. Um, so good biosecurity in South Australia and any state and territory is of the benefit of um, other states and territories, but a lot of the protections are based in, the, in that state and territory itself. So I hope, um, Robert, that answers your question. If not, um, feel free to provide a follow-up. Um, and then a question from Danielle as well around the um, perception in WA that um, biosecurity groups, or rated biosecurity groups as a way that state government could shift responsibility for addressing biosecurity from state to local government. Do you think it's a fair perception? Um, I think based on my level of understanding and, and um, um, engagement with WA, I probably can't speak to whether or not it's a fair perception, but I can um, say that in South Australia, the um, the thinking we're doing around biosecurity programs is not looking to shift responsibility, um, but more about you know, empowering communities to take the lead in areas where they see are important. Um, so um, not looking at taking any sort of responsibility that we're currently managing and shifting it to local government um, under that proposed approach. It's more about taking the, the, that concept of shared respons responsibility out of that model and seeing how it could apply to South Australia. Danny, I hope that answers your question. Um, I just want to touch on the scope of the new Biosecurity Act, um, you know, what we're proposing. So uh, on your screen, hopefully you can see it, is the, um, the, the individual acts that we're propo um, proposing to repeal and replace with the new Biosecurity Act, along with um, the relevant parts of the Fisheries Management Act as well, which would remain um, under this proposal. Um, so in terms of Livestock Act and animal health, the fundamental outcomes that we allow for uh, or that we currently have in um, animal health under the Livestock Act will remain in the new Biosecurity Act. So there, you know, such as the strong powers for the prevention, detection, management and eradication of pests, uh, diseases and contaminants, and the ability to enable proof of freedom for those market requirements that are really important um, in animal health and, and will continue. We'll also continue on with the requirement for certain activities or industries to be uh, registered with um, traceability systems in place. Um, and the new act will also um, still have the ability to list biosecurity matter of concern. So what we refer to as a notifiable uh, disease or condition uh, and still require mandatory notification of their presence or their suspected presence. The new act will also provide the ability to implement restrictions on movement, uh, put control orders in place, uh, declare a biosecurity zone um, to ensure actions are taken day by day to manage risks um, and also those important prevention initiatives such as um, regulation of materials such as swill and ruminant feeds um, will continue to form part of our biosecurity management in animal health. Some of the opportunities for improvement in animal health, um, uh, you know, one is the accreditation scheme. So we currently don't provide for accreditation schemes in animal health. Um, which would enable assurance certificates to be issued that confirm the product is free of a pest or disease or has undergone a, spe a specified treatment. So it's proposed that the new act will provide this opportunity for the livestock industry. Um, and accreditation would also have the ability to be applied to a third party under our proposal, so a non-government provider, um, empowering industry again to take a leading role in biosecurity and provide product certification. The new act is also proposed to have the ability to recognise uh, appropriate existing industry-based quality assurance schemes. So this again empowers the industry to take a lead, which is part of the new Act's core concept of shared responsibility, and but also potentially avoids the um, duplication and the cost, and, and you know um, makes the cost of doing business in South Australia more efficient because we're not setting up a government requirement that's uh, you know similar or, or um, to an industry requirement and requiring people to go through both processes. So essentially the Act will have a, the ability to maintain a standard of biosecurity, but then have the tools to effectively manage people that fall below that standard. Moving on to plant health under the Plant Health Act. So the fundamental outcomes, um, again, in plant health will remain in the new Biosecurity Act. 
So that would be the ability to regulate material through listing um, and still require mandatory reporting for presence or suspected presence of any concern. Um, the accreditation and certification schemes that currently exist in plant health will continue, uh, along with the listing of importers that we currently have in place, which is a critical component of managing our plant biosecurity status. The plant quarantine standard will remain, uh, which outlines the important requirements for importing plants and plant materials into South Australia. Um, opportunities for improvement in plant health. So I've already mentioned the new Act will have a consistent approach across all industries with a single set of principles. So that provides the opportunity to support further traceability in our plant health industries, our plant industries. Um, so there's that um, proposed introduction of property identification codes in line with the national property identification reforms, uh, which have currently been discussed at the national level. Because um, traceability, so it's important for any market access requirements um, along with enhancing our ability to trace any biosecurity issues uh, along the supply chain. So as I said under the framework legislation slide is that um, because the Act will have those general um, powers to enact a policy, it will have the ability to put a registration and traceability system in place. And once the national conversation around plant um, industry property identification codes comes to a resolution, then the Biosecurity Act will be able to enact that policy, um, that system, without having to change the Act. Um, and so you, know, you could think of it in terms of turning on um, those requirements, even when they're required, um, is the way that we're looking to approach this. Um, another area for uh, as an opportunity for improvement um, is the, um, and I've touched on already, is the ability to recognise appropriate industry-based quality assurance schemes. So again, that will be um, available under the plant industries. Um, and empower the industries to take a leading role in managing their biosecurity. Moving on to wild dog management under the Dog Fence Act. So it's proposed that the new Act will continue to establish the Dog Fence Board because um, they've got a really important role and that role needs to continue um, along with their current funding mechanisms. But bringing the Dog Fence Board into the new Act will provide an opportunity to address parts of that legislation which are outdated and problematic and unworkable um, such as the inability to revoke a declared section of the fence, um, change ownership of sections of the fence, um, and it's also an opportunity to better define and permit the control of wild dogs and the governance arrangements for management of the fence. So PERSA um, has engaged with the Dog Fence Board and will continue to engage and work closely with them to ensure that um, what we're proposing is fit for purpose um, and improves on the current arrangements that they have. The Impounding Act of 1920, one of the oldest pieces of legislation we're looking at, um, which manages essentially stray and abandoned livestock. So land managers have a responsibility to ensure their stock do not wander um, from their property onto other private land or public property. Um, and the Impounding Act provides for the impounding of livestock um, and is proposed to be included in the new Biosecurity Act. A majority of the um, impounding Act, just you know, a lot of it due to its age, is no longer relevant or used, and therefore the new Biosecurity Act proposes to include provisions and pick up on that core, um, um, yeah, um, I guess, matter of managing stray and abandoned livestock um, to make sure that we've got a, um, a easy, um, efficient approach to managing that situation. So that's about, you know, if someone finds themselves with uh, in possession of stray livestock, they can't find the, um, the rightful owner, then they've got the opportunity to either keep it, sell it or destroy it um, after a reasonable period of time and after steps have gone through to try and locate the owner. In terms of fisheries and aquaculture biosecurity, moving on to the Fisheries Management Act. So there's an opportunity here to clarify roles and responsibilities between what is a fisheries and aquaculture um, um, responsibility uh, and what is a biosecurity um, responsibility. So biosecurity considerations will still um, form part of um, the fisheries and aquaculture's um, management and decision making, um, but the Biosecurity Act will establish mechanisms to enable biosecurity issues in fisheries and aquaculture to be managed in a legislative sense uh, as a biosecurity matter under the Act. Um, so it, the new Act will work alongside the Fisheries Management Act to complement it um, and, and have the ability to manage noxious species. The powers will also remain in the Fisheries Management Act to ensure that the um, management of put and take fisheries, release and escape of aquaculture fish and conservation restocking uh, can continue to be appropriately managed by fisheries and aquaculture because they use the same provisions that we would need to have in the Biosecurity Act 
uh, to manage biosecurity matters. Um, but regardless of the legislation, Fisheries um, and Aquaculture Division and Biosecurity SA are in the same department and they have a good working relationship, work very closely together and that relationship will continue. Uh, this is just about where the clarity sits within the legislation. Um, in addition, the Act would need to work alongside and um, complement other legislation in South Australia. Um, so examples would be the Phloxera and Grape Industry Act. Um, the Landscape South Australia Act and you know, emergency management legislation and public health legislation, those sorts of things. So um, there's going to be referencing required and also just making sure that um, the, the acts work uh, well alongside each other. So just moving now on to a, another poll question. So I'll just get Jen to fire that one up. Um, just while you're answering the poll, I might just turn to the Q&A. So there's a question there from uh, Josh Kennett, uh, which is a good one, around, um, you know, again, concern with shared responsibility um, around funding. And this is, this is a question that has come up um, a number of times in, in various forms um, around small industries are already underfunded. So if more responsibility means more industry funds, it could cause issues. So um, completely understand that. So I guess what we're proposing is around the shared responsibility um, is around an opportunity to take responsibility, an opportunity to take a leadership. Um, we're not saying that um, it's an obligation. So um, government will still run, um, you know, set that biosecurity standard and we'll still have government um, design and led programs. But there's also is that ability for industry if they have a program that they want to design and run themselves and it meets the requirements of the state um, legislation, the biosecurity standards that we um, need, then the legislation would have an ability to recognise that. But it's an opportunity, not a requirement. Um, but when we talk about the general biosecurity duty, uh, I just should clarify that would be a legal requirement. Um, but if people are already practising um, biosecurity um, standards and, and behaviours in their industry, then the biosecurity duty is, is likely unlikely to add any more um, requirements on their day-to-day their -day operations. So the results are in. Um, strong agreement majority there, so two-thirds uh, roughly, um, with some agreement and again some uncertainty. So um, if you'd like to expand on your uncertainty, we'd, we'd really like to hear about it. So Q&A or, or contact us outside of the session. So in terms of governance and administration, want to touch on as well there's a bit bit in here so bear with me um the first one is around the statutory positions as we refer to them so they're, they're the chief officers so it's proposed that the new biosecurity act will provide for two chief officer positions one being the chief veterinary officer and the other being the chief plant protection officer um, as the principal authorized officers in the legislation um that statutory positions or the chief officers are not new to south australia um, the Livestock Act and the Plant Health Act already established chief officers. Um, so they're the chief inspector of stock and the chief inspector, respectively. Um, and, but one of the areas we do want to improve is around the um, management appointment um, and the powers of deputy chief officers. Um, so what we need to be able to do is have the ability to have deputy chief officers engaged, which have the powers and functions of the chief officer. So they're able to exercise those powers and continue to keep a, a response or actions um, moving and decisions being made um, when in the absence of the chief officer. So if you think about an emergency situation, which is you know, a 24 seven um, um, focus, um, chief officer is not gonna be around uh, all the time. Uh, and so it's the ability to have deputy chief officers um, step in and um, continue to keep the response moving because uh, staff commonly work in shifts during those situations. So it's an important in terms of making sure we have continual coverage um, in the areas we need it. So having two chief officers is proposed um, as the preferred approach, but there is also the option of having a single um, a chief biosecurity officer. But the, we're proposing two separate positions um, because it enables you to have distinct technical advice, um, one focus on animal health, the other on plant health. Um, and that, advice, that technical understanding um, would feed into the decision-making of those positions um, and is, is uh, explicitly attached to the role. Um, 
So the statutory positions, along with authorised biosecurity officers, would um, be responsible for most of the day-to-day -day operational and technical uh, functions and decision making under the Act. Um, the other area is around statutory authorities. So biosecurity in South Australia is um, delivered in partnership with key statutory authorities. Um, and each authority has defined roles and responsibilities, um, which is articulated in the, um, the acts that establish them. Um, they provide an important contribution um, and share responsibility for biosecurity. So again, it's another great example. Um, and this, this approach can be an, an excellent model, that industry-led um, partnership through the statutory authority with government for biosecurity outcomes. Uh, and so we're proposing that the new act will have the ability to establish any additional new future um, statutory authorities by regulation, um, if that's required uh, or, or desired um, in the future. In terms of registration, um, a registration system um, to all likely where is fundamental to the operation of a, an effective traceability system uh, and biosecurity responses. Um, the Livestock Act requires um, a person to be registered to keep certain livestock or to carry out artificial breeding or operate a, a veterinary diagnostic laboratory. Uh, and the Plant Health Act similarly requires registration of accredited, sorry, accredited production areas and, and also importers. So the new Biosecurity Act will continue to provide for registration system um, as per the existing legislation. Um, but the requirement for what types of businesses or produce or activities or facilities uh, or circumstances that will, will trigger that requirement for registration will be determined by the regulation. The registration system will need to be flexible um, and ensure there's no unnecessary burden on our industries. Um, and we want to build in some flexibility, which might be in the form of exemptions, either a general exemption or a case by case. Uh, in certain circumstances, uh, and the use of um, permits um, to be used potentially in lieu of registration, um, so, um, you know, when appropriate. Um, also, thinking around the ability to provide for an enterprise registration. So if you've got a business um, that has a number of activities that require registration, rather than having to register each um, activity, you can have an enterprise registration, which covers everything. Um, the um, the new Biosecurity Act will also provide the um, capacity we're proposing to recognise interstate registration. Um, so where businesses reach across borders uh, or do business across borders um, and South Australia's requirements are being met, um, then having that registration formally recognised. Um, in terms of moving on to traceability, um, it's the ability, as we all know, to track produce through all stages of production, uh, their processing and distribution. Um, including importation and retail. So the ability to trace produce from its origin along the supply chain is critical to biosecurity um, management um, because of that and rapid, uh, rapid identification um, and um, also knowing where relevant properties are located to assess biosecurity risk um, and um, help response in any sort of disease or pest outbreak. Um, traceability is also important for product assurance um, in assessing domestic and international markets. Uh, as well as assisting to identify where, um, you know, as I said before, those susceptible so crops or, or supply chain um, premises are located. So the new Biosecurity Act will continue to support traceability through registration and property identification codes. Um, and current traceability systems will continue while also ensuring that the Act is structured in such a way uh, that we can facilitate any changes or um, expansion of traceability in the future. Moving on to accreditation authorities. So part four of the Plant Health Act um, already provides for the establishment of accreditation schemes. Um, and the, that accreditation authorises a person to issue assurance certificates in relation to the movement of a plant or plant related product. Uh, and also um, enables the, um, to verify assurance certificates. Um, sorry. Um, Certif certificates in relation to the movement of plant or plant related products and also verify assurance certificates or other documents um, or also the um, packaging or labelling of plants and plant related products. Um, the Livestock Act doesn't provide for this. So there's an opportunity there to um, broaden out this opportunity across all sectors. Um, but, you know, so what currently exists in the um, Plant Health Act um, enabling that to be broadened out to the um, livestock um, industries. It's also proposed that the chief officers will be accreditation authorities in their own right, 
uh, with the ability to accredit biosecurity certifiers and appoint biosecurity auditors. But we also um, want the Biosecurity Act um, to be able to recognise non-government organisation as accreditation authorities, which I've already touched on, who then in turn may accredit the biosecurity certifiers and biosecurity auditors um, to inspect business operations and provide that product certification. Um, if an industry already participates in an appropriate certification or auditing scheme, it's proposed that the new Biosecurity Act will have the ability to recognise these schemes along with appropriate interstate schemes. In terms of auditing, um, the new Act will provide for biosecurity audit schemes, um, which is a requirement of some existing interstate and international market um, access agreements. Um, so it's likely that um, what we're proposing is the new Biosecurity Act will require auditing as a condition of um, registration for high risk biosecurity entities um, to check compliance with the registration and the legislation to make sure we're managing that risk. Um, or it could be used for um, during applications for registration or accreditation as a biosecurity certifier or the approval as an accreditation authority. Um, and it's also really important for checking compliance um, along the way as well um, in terms of the audit program. Certification. So the new Act will support a certification scheme. Um, and this concept's not new uh, in South Australia because um, we have the current involvement in the national certification scheme which relates to the movement of plants and plant products, uh, which um, is known as the Interstate Certification Assurance Scheme or the ICA scheme. So the new Biosecurity Act will be developed to enable certification of produce uh, to be expanded across other industries um, if required. So that could enable certification that livestock uh, are free of a certain pest or disease. So continuing to provide for biosecurity certificates in the new Act will um, provide assurance that allow for the transit of certified produce within South Australia and, and interstate. Um, moving on to permits. So it's proposed that the new Act would enable permits to be issued that allow for a broad range of actions to be undertaken, which may otherwise be in breach of the legislation. Um, permits would only be provided where the Chief Officer is satisfied that there's a good and valid reason to issue a permit. And um, it may be subject to conditions or limitations. Um, and before providing or approving a permit, the factors such as the, the, the relative risk of the pest or the disease, the proposed activity and the, um, the level of management required to manage that risk um, um, would need to be considered along with the um, period of time the permit is required before approval is granted. In terms of prohibited matter, so the new Act will continue to provide for um, the ability to list prohibited matter um, so to declare it and, and publicly list it, um, along with the requirement to notify um, Biosecurity SA in, in PERSA uh, if prohibited matter is um, detected or suspected. Um, and so when I say prohibited matter, I'm referring to biosecurity matter that would have a significant impact on the economy, the environment, or the, um, if it in, um, or the community if it entered the state. Um, so the Plant Health Act um, already enables the declaration of things other than pests and diseases to be regulated. So for example, packaging, timber, equipment and machinery. Uh, and just to make the point that that ability will continue in the new Biosecurity Act as well, because it's very important. Um, okay, so moving on now to a, another poll question. I'll just get Jen to uh, load, load that one up. And there's actually two questions for this section. So there'll be this one and then um, we'll move on to the next one. Okay, we might just call that one to a close. So interesting results here. Um, so strong agreement against some uncertainty, but also a strong disagree as well. Um, so um, I'd love to hear why um, a strong disagree. You know, is it a single um, approach, a single chief biosecurity officer is preferred, um, or is there some other um, issue that um, you're responding to there? So I'd love to hear more about that. Um, so just moving on now to the second poll question.
And while you're responding there, I might just turn to some of the questions. Um, so question from Danielle Wiseman around the chief plant and, and animal officers taking responsibility for, sorry, will those chief officers take responsibility for plants and animals associated with environmental biosecurity or only regard to industry related biosecurity? Um, so early on in our consultation, we did propose um, whether or not we would have a chief environmental biosecurity officer. Um, and we were also proposing um, to bring parts of the Landscape Act into the new Biosecurity Act. Um, through the consultation, that proposal um, um, wasn't supported. So we're now um, looking to work alongside the Landscape South Australia Act and complement that legislation. Um, so it really is that the devil will be in the detail. So um, environmental biosecurity will largely be managed um, under the Landscape South Australia Act, which is led by um, Environment uh, and Water Department under um, the Minister for Environment and Water. Um, but there will be some, well, there will be engagement with Biosecurity SA um, and um, some involvement of um, um, the chief officers in some of those responses, but it depends on what what part of environmental biosecurity is a very broad term. So is the, is the pest or disease um, um, declared under the NRM Act or is it new? Uh, is it an invertebrate? Does it have an impact on primary production? These are all details that need to be worked through before um, the appropriate response um, um, is um, defined and the, and the responsibility is um, um, clear, made clear. Um, so Sarah Thompson's question, in terms of the Chief Veterinary Officer and Chief Plant Protection Officer, uh, where, who will be responsible for aquatic and marine environments? Um, there's, um, at the moment, it's the Chief Veterinary Officer that deals with diseases um, in the marine environment, because um, um, things like oysters are considered livestock. Um, but there's also the involvement of the Aquaculture Act and the Fisheries Management Act. Um, and again, it's, it's one of those um, devil in the details of it's wild catch or it's, it's farmed or if it's um, considered livestock. Um, but one of the things we'll be looking to address is, is having that clarity around biosecurity responses. Um, and so responsibility for those marine aquatic environments will likely fall to the, the Chief Veterinary Officer. Um, but in some situations where there's like a um, marine um, or um, sort of weed or a species, and then um, might be involved with the chief plant protection officer as well. Um, but to be um, happy to sort of, when we've got more detail around the, the bill and, and you know, the feedback that will inform how that's um, um, established, um, you know, one of the things would be good to do is to run some scenarios through uh, to test those arrangements to make sure we have the clarity that we're looking for. Uh, in terms of the poll results, um, so around non-government entities being accredited. Um, so some strong agreement, but um, mostly falling within the agreement and, but also not sure. So again, with some of the other responses, it's likely some of that, um, you know, what is the detail? How is it gonna work? Um, how is it gonna benefit um, or work with industry arrangements? Maybe driving some of that uncertainty uh, would be my suspicion. So again, love to hear more about it if you've got more um, information to share. Just touching on compliance, um, so the new Biosecurity Act um, proposes flexible and responsive, um, responsive compliance framework. Um, and we want that to be commensurate to the risk that um, is, is being managed. So that would involve taking a scalable approach. So, you know, at one end of the scale, focusing on voluntary compliance, uh, creating an effective deterrent um, and responding to non-compliance in a way that takes into account the circumstances and the behaviours uh, and also the public interest. So this model of compliance um, assumes that most people will comply or try to comply with their obligations. So most people want to do the right thing and do do the right thing. But despite having good intentions, some people inadvertently fall, uh, uh, sorry, fall below that standard and fail to comply um, because they either don't understand their biosecurity requirements um, uh, or there's uh, some other uh, issue driving that non-compliance. So in this situation, there may be um, an increase in monitoring or audit rates um, might be the response um, until compliance is established. Um, and then moving up the scale, um, there's some people who may choose to knowingly do the wrong thing uh, if an opportunity arises. So it's important to ensure that there are effective deterrent strategies uh, within the Act um, to deter people from making the wrong choices. So risk and reward. So if the reward of um, an opportunity to do the wrong, um, the wrong thing to, to, to gain an, a, um, an advantage is not, um, does not outweigh the penalty uh, of being caught is you know, that effective deterrent strategy. 
Um, and then at the more extreme end of the scale, there's a small number of people may choose to deliberately uh, contravene the law to avoid either regulatory action or gain an advantage. Um, and so in that situation, we'll have the powers and the ability to respond with appropriate enforcement action. Uh, and that could include criminal prosecution in a court of law. Um, authorised officers. So it's critical that authorised officers have sufficient powers to take action under the new act when required. Um, and the new act will not look to diminish or remove any of the current powers that we have in the current system. Um, but we want to strengthen those appropriate powers um, by consolidating powers uh, and making them consistent across animal health and plant health um, and making sure they, they meet that national agreed standard of um, best practice um, in compliance and enforcement. Um, so we'll have uh, the new act will establish a, a, a set of standardised um, um, and contemporary powers for biosecurity officers, um, which, which will be appropriate and, and take a broad focus across all biosecurity management. And that will be consistent with other jurisdictions um, who have introduced um, consolidated biosecurity acts. Um, in terms of biosecurity um, obligations, um, sorry, sorry, um, biosecurity direction. The new act will provide the ability for a biosecurity officer to issue a biosecurity direction. Uh, so an example might be you know, directing someone to wash down equipment before leaving an area or um, secure a premises to um, prevent the escape of a pest or a disease. Um, we're proposing two types of directions, the one being a general direction um, and that would apply, um, or sorry, general direction or an individual biosecurity direction. So a general direction would apply to the public generally um, or to a specified class of persons. And an individual biosecurity direction would apply to a particular person or a business. So an authorised biosecurity officer would um, have the power to issue the biosecurity directions if they reasonably believe it's necessary to manage any risk or impact uh, or to enforce the requirement under the new act. Um, it's not a new concept in South Australia. Um, they currently exist in a similar way under the Livestock Act um, and also um, the Plant Health Act as well. Um, just using slightly different language, but the intent, the outcome will be um, the same um, and similar in the new Biosecurity Act. So any direction that's issued would lay out the uh, actions that need to be taken, the grounds on which the direction is based and the reason why it's been issued um, and the nature of non-compliance. Um, and also provide a time frame in which um, compliance is required. Um, in situations where someone doesn't comply, then the biosecurity um, authorised officer will have the ability to either take the action themselves or cause the action to be taken and recover the cost of doing so. Um, control orders. Um, so both the Plant Health Act and the Livestock Act currently provide for the issuing of orders um, and they're to put controls in place to um, control um, the eradication of a pest or disease or a contaminant. So the new act will provide to continue to provide for control orders um, that will enable directions or directives to be given that can be applied regionally or statewide. Um, and they will provide for that rapid response where a new biosecurity risk is identified um, and action is required to be taken. So um, a control order will be used to either prohibit, uh, regulate or control activities to um, prevent the introduction um, or to eradicate a biosecurity matter that provo proposes a, a biosecurity risk. Um, and they'll generally be made to eradicate or prevent the spread uh, of biosecurity matter, but they're not intended to be long-term management tools. So they'll have the ability to be made quickly um, and provide an immediate response to a biosecurity risk while longer term management arrangements are being developed. Um, and also they could also be used to transition um, out of an emergency situation. So sort of a, a medium term controls while you're looking to, to move towards long term controls. So a control order would set a, 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 a geographical area, define an area, um, and then it would um, require certain control measures um, to be um, put in place in that defined area. Um, it'll also state the subject or the target of the order um, and, and who the measures apply to and how long the order will be enforced. Um, and they'll be scalable. So it can either be sort of a, a, at a small area of part of the state right up to the, um, the whole extent of the state. So that provides that flexibility in response um, and also, um, you know, 
enables that rapid response, that, that quick action to be put in place, which is really important when a biosecurity risk is um, suspected or, you know, emerging. Um, more of the, the longer term management approach would be around, uh, would be um, enacted through biosecurity zones. Um, so under the Plant Health Act, the minister may declare a whole uh, or portion of the state as a quarantine area for the purpose of controlling or eradicating a disease or a contamination. Uh, and under the Livestock Act, the minister may prohibit entry into or movement within or out of the state or a specified part of the state of livestock, livestock products or um, other property. So it's proposed that the new act will continue to enable the establishment of zones, um, again, for that flexible response um, and to manage biosecurity risks uh, in situations where specific management initiatives are required to manage that risk. So biosecurity zone would be long-term management of an ongoing biosecurity issue or impact. Um, and they'll be related to a specific defined area where actions must be taken when interacting with the biosecurity zone. Um, so biosecurity zones generally would be used where eradication is not feasible. Uh, but there is still a high biosecurity risk requiring action to manage the impacts. So, but they also may be used where different management actions are needed in different parts of the state or to protect part of the state uh, from a biosecurity risk that occurs elsewhere in the state. So a zone could be used to keep things in or keep things out. So a zone would be established by a regulation um, and similar to a control order, will define that area and the action required within that area to manage the risk. Um, touching on permits, so if there are some actions that need to be taken that would be contrary to the requirements of that zone, then looking at the ability to have a permit to enable someone to undertake that action, if that's appropriate and required, because the biosecurity zone might um, in, have unforeseen um, restrictions on, on um, activities that are not the intention, and so we want to have the ability to address that without having to amend the regulation and the zone to, to build in that flexibility to help um, um, business to continue where appropriate and required. In terms of offences uh, and penalties, so as per the current legislation, the Biosecurity Act will have a range of offences and penalties um, that can be either ex um, expiated or prosecuted. Um, and when the biosecurity bill is produced, each section that has a penalty or an offence will be clearly um, shown um, with the, the amount of the penalty there, and then that's um, able to provide feedback on the, um, the appropriateness of those penalties. Um, so that, that detail um, will come at a later stage, but just uh, raising now, you know, the Act will continue to provide for those penalties. Um, and, and two tiers, there'll be penalties for a corporation, a business, and, and penalties for a natural person or an individual. Um, in terms of the actual penalties though, the because the legislation we're dealing with is, is quite old, a lot of the penalties are no longer commensurate to the risk that we're managing and they just don't provide that effective deterrent, which is really important. So for an example, in the Livestock Act, if you were to introduce a notifiable disease into South Australia, the maximum penalty is $20,000. So if you think of about you know, foot and mouth as a notifiable disease, it's estimated that um, the cost to Australia would be $16 billion for a large scale 12 month outbreak and up to $50 billion over 10 years. So you can see that 20,000 is just not commensurate to the size of that economic impact of that risk, not to mention the impact on you know, individuals. Um, livelihoods and, and the recovery period um, that would extend beyond that. So we're looking at um, increasing penalties. Um, and just an example, the um, New South Wales Biosecurity Act of 2015, so you know, look, coming you know, five years old now, um, provides a maximum penalty for a category one offence, which, which would be that notifiable disease offence of $1.1 million or imprisonment for three years or both for an individual and for a corporation that steps up to 2.2. So you can see there's a big gap between our 20,000 uh, and an interstate um, example there. So we'll be looking to, to increase. Um, I might um, move straight on to emergency management. So in the um, Biosecurity Act, we'll provide, uh, you know, as, as currently, the legal framework required to deal with a biosecurity emergency. Um, and we'll continue to be guided by those national approaches, such as the National Emergency Response Deeds and, and the agreements and plans that we already have in place. 
Um, the current legislation provides for emergency action to be taken um, if the inspector, the chief, chief inspector, considers on reasonable grounds that an urgent action is required. Um, and the new Biosecurity Act will continue to enable that quick and decisive action to be taken in, in the most urgent situations, um, even um, when there's a level of uncertainty. Um, so you know, using emergency orders um, is what we're proposing, um, which would enable um, an emergency zone to be established uh, with emergency measures that need to be followed. And that would be um, similar to a control order, but the difference being who's able to issue them, how long they're issued for, uh, and the type of measures that can be put in place um, for that emergency situation. Um, so they will be used to isolate an emergency area um, and um, the biosecurity matter uh, that we're looking to um, uh, manage and take steps to eradicate it if it's practical uh, or prevent its spread. Um, I just want to touch on now um, in terms of the next step. So um, when I started on, I talked started the session. I talked about the 18 months of um, targeted consultation that we've done to get to this point. Um, and so now um, we're out for public consultation. Currently closing on the 24th of November. Um, we're currently at stage two of the project. With all the feedback that we receive, um, that will then feed into um, uh, informing drafting instructions and the development of a draft bill. Uh, and then we want to come back out and share the draft bill with you um, for further consultation to, to you know, because that's the, um, when, when you start to see how these concepts, these proposals are expressed in legislation, um, that can change or, or increase um, the understanding of, of what's being proposed. So we're really keen to seek feedback on the bill stage uh, and continue to work with, um, with all of you um, on its development. Once we've been through that process and finalised the bill, um, um, and, and in parallel to, we'll be looking at um, the subordinate instruments, so the regulations, what do they need to allow for? What are the outcomes we need? Uh, and we wanna try and provide as much detail as we can uh, to help inform how the bill and the, the, the incomplete framework will look um, as it moves through the parliamentary process. But the usual um, approach is you have an act in place and then you work on regulations. Um, and so we won't actually have actual regulations, but we'll be able to hopefully be able to provide the intent of those regulations and the outcomes that they're allowing for. Then after we move through the parliamentary process, we'll have the commencement date from the Act, um, and then focus will shift on to you know, training, uh, setting up systems, um, working on the regulations, um, consultation engagement, uh, and the implementation of the Act, um, and then through to um, completing the legislative framework. So looking to introduce the bill into parliament next year, but the um, commencement date, the implementation uh, and, and further consultation on the regulations will continue um, um, beyond those, uh, that date uh, and into the following years. So it's, um, we've, we've come a long way, uh, but we've still got a long way to go as well. Um, and um, a lot of engagement on the way through. Also, um, just before we go to questions, um, I just want to again reiterate that we're the public consultation and how you can um, give us feedback. So on your screen is just a um, screenshot of the Your Say website. Um, so if you just go into Google or whatever search engine you use and type in Your Say, um, it'll bring you through to the main page and then it's very easy to find the um, Building a New Biosecurity Act for South Australia engagement. Click into that area and bring you up to these pages. So this provides the information about what we're proposing links to the key documents where you can provide uh, um, find further information. It's also got a link to the PERSA website where again, there's further information. Um, and there's also ability to join into an online discussion, ask questions similar to the Q&A that we've got going today. There's an online survey to provide feedback, or you may wish to provide a written submission that doesn't answer questions, it just provides your, your thoughts and views. Um, that can be emailed to us or posted to us. Um, but it's not one or the other. You could do a survey and a submission um, as well. Uh, and there's also contact details there if you want to get in contact with us. So if you want to set up another meeting or have another presentation or conversation during the public consultation and beyond, uh, please feel free to reach out and let us know. Um, so now I'm just turning to questions. I'll just turn to the, the Q&A um, board where there's a couple of questions already. So Josh Kennett says, um, I believe cost recovery is an issue that PERSA should definitely address. Um, so you can take that on board. Um, um, I, I don't know, um, um, I'll just a general call out to, to Nathan, the Executive Director of Biosecurity SA, who's with us as well. If there's any questions you want to um, answer, Nathan, please just jump straight in. 
Um, another question from Robert Chin. So general, a general question, how will this act vary from those in other states territories that already have them? Um, so that's a very good question. So one of the key um, differences will be that our legislation will work alongside the environmental biosecurity legislation in the Landscape Act, whereas in other jurisdictions, but not all, um, have that integrated within their biosecurity legislation. Um, there's also um, subtle differences in terms of, you know, um, some of the areas I've touched on in terms of biosecurity programs um, and also um, some of the um, powers around, you know, um, um, registration and uh, um, accreditation. So, because um, what we're looking at doing is continuing on with the, the good aspects of our current legislation that we want to continue with. Um, and some of those are unique to South Australia. Um, and so therefore there'll be points of difference, but um, there'll be good points of difference. So one of the ones like in the plant health industry where we require registration of importers. Um, and, but generally speaking, there'll be a, 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 a significant amount of similarity with other jurisdictions that have consolidated legislation. Um, because we're looking to those jurisdictions to inform our approach and we're working very closely with them, but also um, every other jurisdiction has worked um, among themselves as well in developing their act. So uh, Queensland, um, when they developed their act, were working with um, New South Wales, um, New South Wales worked with Tasmania and, and working with Western Australia as well. The um, Australian Capital Territory is looking to the New South Wales model to inform their model. Uh, and Victoria are, are doing some thinking as well um, and um, looking to the other jurisdictions. So just by working together, um, there's a lot of similarity, but also the national biosecurity model as well. There's the national biosecurity committee that all the jurisdictions sit on uh, and discuss uh, the um, biosecurity for the nation. Um, and then there's agreements that are put in place where jurisdictions agree to enact some of those um, policies, principles in their own legislation. So there's, you know, the harmonisation across the country is happening um, and will continue to happen. Um, so if there's any other questions, please um, put your, um, put them into the Q&A um, and, um, or raise your hand and we can unmute you and you can um, um, talk verbally um, and ask your question. Um, David Campbell's just um, written a question. So with a general biosecurity duty, are you considering requiring the adoption of a farm gate biosecurity action plan to support risk mitigation? Um, so I know that this has been important in other jurisdictions where that's part of um, the basis for farm trespass, um, where you know if you have a, a farm biosecurity plan and someone was to uh, enter a property uh, and ignore that plan, then that's a basis, um, that's a breach, and then you can take action. Um, so you were you know, encouraging good biosecurity standard, but in terms of actually mandating um, farm gate biosecurity is not something we're con um, currently proposing under the new act, but um, you know, give us some more feedback around that. Is that something that you think should be considered or, or um, you know, there's some good outcomes from that approach? Um, I might just generally throw to Nathan um, if there's anything that Nathan would like to say or, or any um, um, additions that you wanna to make to any of the answers that I've given, Nathan. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Look, no, I, I think you're right. I don't really have too much to add to, to most of those. Um, I think on in terms of uh, the consistency of our act with the other, other states' acts, I think that's something that we have looked to um, make sure that we are consistent with the other states as far as we can, but where there is a specific point of difference that is special for South Australia, then we, we accommodate that as well. I think if you look at the intent of modernising our legislation, it is largely to ensure that we are consistent across the biosecurity system. Obviously, Australia's got a, a system that starts offshore and then comes through the broader the border and then onshore, and that needs to work seamlessly. And uh, and our legislation was perhaps, or current legislation is perhaps lagging in that regard. Um, however, each of those elements also needs to be able to stand on its own and operate independently too. So. It's a, it's a bit of a balancing act between giving us exactly what we want to do, what we need to do, but also ensuring that the way we do it is consistent where it needs to be with those other states. So yeah, it's, it's part of the considerations, but not the only consideration. Thanks, Nathan. Okay, we still have, um, we have time, about nine minutes. So um, please put in your questions or, or raise your hand. Um, but if, um, if there's nothing, we'll give a, a minute or so, um, but if there's uh, no further questions, we can, we can call it to an end early. So please you know, put in your questions if you have them.
Um, to enable um, time for questions, I skipped a couple of poll questions. So maybe if, if you're thinking of your questions, we can go back to some of the polls uh, that I skipped. Um, so I'll just get Jen to load up one of the earlier polls. And while she does that, there's a, a question, um, Robert Chen. So did you say that PICs were going to be part of this new act? Um, so yes, um, the um, PICs are an important part of uh, traceability, so the property identification codes. So we currently have those in the um, uh, livestock animal health industries, and that will continue. Um, and there is also that national conversation happening at the moment about whether or not that will be introduced in the plant health industries. Um, and so the new act will enable that to happen if and when that's decided. So the answer to that question is yes. Um, just turning to the, well, we haven't published the results yet. So the, the poll should be up now around compliance. Okay, so do you support appropriate and strong compliance powers and penalties for non-compliance? So yeah, either strongly agree or agree. So it's, it's really important that that effective deterrent as we've talked through. So thanks for your feedback. Maybe move to the next one, the last one. So the last poll now. So do you support the ability for action to be taken quickly in a biosecurity emergency? So that's um, around um, reasonable suspicion so not having to wait for um, evidence confirmation before actions put in place um, to enable that rapid response and to um, get ahead of the, of the situation um, while more information is collected. So getting some strong agreement here, which is good. So it's you know, is a, is a, a very important part of biosecurity response. So it's good to see that it's strong agreement. Um, an agreement, but also a little bit of uncertainty as well. So again, you know, what, what's reasonable um, is an important question. Um, you know, so making sure that um, yeah, it's reasonable and that action is taken reasonably in those situations will be important. So what, what's the definition around that? What are some of the supporting principles to guide that decision-making will be really important. Um, reasonable is not something that's defined in legislation. It is very much defined by the courts, um, but there'll have to be um, um, guidance around um, the decision makers when making um, that assessment. Okay, I might, um, there's no more questions, it hasn't been for a little while and um, people are starting to drop out, um, which is fine. So I might just uh, pull that to a close. Um, thank you to Jen for the introduction. Thank you to Nathan for uh, joining us and, and your contributions. And thank you to all of you for joining in as well. Um, as Jen said at the start, um, we will um, make this um, the webinar has been recorded and we'll make it available. So we'll actually um, put it up on our website and provide you with a link um, so you can watch it back um, at your leisure. Um, or you may wish to sort of share it with other people as well who may have an interest there. And um, just a reminder of our contact details uh, up on the screen now if you want to reach out for any further information or conversations or provide any other feedback. So thanks again, uh, and we look forward to hearing from all of you um, by the 24th of November. Thank you very much.